Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode two of the Zender Garden podcast. I'm Ground. I'm here with Cam, Dead Shaman, Domen, Mint, aka Carmen, No Science Today, User Minus One, The Function Call, and Xeno Index. How's everyone doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Oh, I made a nine Edo um, breakbeat and break core, so I'm pretty pumped. But now I'm that anxious about sick. finishing my album, so. I, uh, I recently worked on my version of the Nine Edo Tuning of the Month project, and the moment it was submitted and over, I converted it to 25 Edo. <laughs> Why? Because 25 Edo is better. It's So 25 Edo is like the perfect tuning for Pentagoth, which is a Mavilla-type temperament that the user minus one and I came up with, and it's like... It's the best Mavilla, in my opinion. I made a whole Tumblr post about it. Yeah, it was really cool. I was the one who contributed to the fact that, like, you can basically make them... You can basically think of the minor chord as 17, colon, 20, colon, 25. Yeah, I'd been using... I'd been using a version of Pentagoth for a long time before he suggested that, but I never... For some reason, I never realized that, uh... It's otonal. Like, the... Like, the... Uh, 17, 20, 25 is otonal. Like, I used a version of that temperament with the 20 over 17 minor third. I came up with that temperament, I just never realized that it was an otonal chord. And that suggestion that you made was kind of what got the whole thing really started. Whoa. Yeah, I didn't upload it yet, but last night I was working on uh, a porcupine song. Um, I never used Porcupine before. I expected it to be all weird, but it's not weird. It's pretty normal. Um, so, yeah, it's only like 45 seconds long, because that's like how long all of my songs are. But I'm going to upload it. I think it sounds pretty good. I think all my songs are about four minutes long, approximately. I used to, back when I didn't understand what was tasteless repetition, I used to write songs that were like seven to ten minutes long. I'm glad I don't do that anymore. Re-listenability is more important. Does classical music ever do that? I mean, not tasteless rep repetition. Oh, okay. Well, what kind of repetition would you consider tasteful? That's a really complicated question, and the only answer to that really is the type the type of rep the uh, type of repetition that I've come to find to be acceptable as I've become better as a musician. Uh. The ending of the third movement of Moonlight Sonata <coughs> is a, an example of tasteless repetition. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there there is some tasteless repetition in classical music. Let's go. I think the rule here is um, repetition legitimizes until it doesn't, and then it just becomes boring and sad. As I have said before, repetition legitimizes. Repetition is annoying. Therefore, legitimacy is annoying. Ouch. Therefore, th therefore, annoyance is legitimate. <laughs> I think repetition legitimizes until you've legitimated enough, and then it can't go any further. It's just until you've legitimated enough. Monosodium legitimate. I think that was in the uh, food that I ate earlier. <laughs> I love the moment when he said, let's legitimize and legitimized all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh yeah. Definitely one of the legitimizations of all time. That meme is so stupid, but it's great. Um Yep. I was going to say about repetition. So I feel like so if you don't have any repetition at all, then like things kind of fall apart because you kind of lack structure and then things just keep on like going all over the place like if you had a song that went like i mean you might call that like zen harmonic freeform jazz or something but like there's no repetition there so you can't hear like the structure in it so i think there's kind of like this curve almost like the dissonance curve where, like, no repetition is pretty bad. You get, like, a little bit of repetition, then it gets better, then it gets better. And then once you pause that, like, the more you repeat, then the worse it gets again, because it's, like, too static. 
Yeah. So what I didn't understand when I was a younger musician is just how boring things could get if I repeated too much. And that's why my songs are pretty much all about four minutes long. I'm talking about like 13, 14 years old. Repetition is not a problem for me anymore, but it used to be. It wasn't back then. It isn't now anymore. I think that the most important thing when it comes to repetition, legitimizing, is that um, it's about variance if you have repetition generally. Because, like, in my songs, yet again, they're only like a minute long, but like, uh, they're usually like looping sort of songs. They don't take like samples from stuff, but it like plays four chords that loops in the whole time. And then, like, the melody comes in. And then the next time, like, a different instrument comes in, and each time you listen to it, it sounds kind of different, even though it's the same things just layered on top of each other. Would it be possible for us to, like, listen to music in this podcast? It would be interesting, but that would that would involve, like, more setup. Like, we could try to do that next time, like, with additional setup. We could get, like, an extra, um, like, participant just, like, to be a music player. That way we can all listen to it and react to it. Yeah, that's a good idea. We'll, we'll do that next time. I also thought it would be funny, like, if one time for the podcast, we just all tried to have this mega collab on a track and just, like, have that be the podcast. That would be really interesting. Yeah, that'd be cool. We'd have everyone working on different projects, and then we all send them into the chat to, like, be combined. Hey, guys, my, ca- my cat won't stop meowing, so I'll be gone for a minute. Got it. Okay. No, no, no. We the the cat meowing is fine. Oh, okay. The I don't. I'm not even hearing it. Have y'all ever heard of Alm Studio? No. What? Yeah. What now? It was like an online collaborative doll. Yeah. Simultaneously <laughs> work on a project over the internet with the people. But I think it got shut down. Yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah, I used it before. The thing is, I feel like collaborating with Reaper would be relatively viable if we had, like, the same set of, like, free synths and stuff and things would transfer over regularly okay. The only problem would be with using samples because, like, it would just be so annoying to have to get, like, the right file pot every time unless there's a way for Reaper to do, like, relative file pots nah, or something. It, it'd probably be fine. Like, when you save the project, you can just select copy all media to project folder and then you can zip that oh, up. And then you can zip it. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And as far as VSTs go, I mean, how many microtonal enabled VSTs are there that most of us will probably be using, like Surge? Surge is the best synth in my opinion are we talking about synths or just vst the the best um zen synth or synth period oh okay well i mean there's probably better synths period but i'm not really willing to consider one if it isn't zen capable yeah i can't i can't speak on synth. i actually prefer vital to surge just because i find it easier to work with but i need to go in and like learn surge a bit better because there's a lot of things that it seems to be able to do especially with like its extensive collection of like filters and oscillators and stuff see i'd put citrus and zen above vital and surge but citrus isn't for a long period of time i've been using vcv rec for all (laughs) that i need from a synth for everything i mean i guess that's fair but i'm too like fractal brain to be able to figure out how like modular stuff works get it because it's the opposite of smooth brain which is ironic because like yeah i was just thinking that although ironically fractals have like fractional dimensions which means that in a way, like a three-dimensional fractal could have a dimension that's closer to two-dimensional, which would be a smooth brain. Uh, the, the, there is one that is actually uh, two-dimensional. Uh, it's the t- 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 tetrahedron, uh, which is divided uh, into Serpinski's four tetrahedron. tetrahedron. Yeah, yeah, basically uh, Serpinski tetrahedron, it has uh, it is a 3D object but it's 
fractal uh, dimensionality. I'm not sure how uh, to articulate it, but basically, it is two dimensional in a strange way. Okay, the one really cool thing about the Serpinxi tetrahedron is if you look at it from the right angle, it just looks like a square because of how all of them just like overlap. It's so cool. Well, depends on projection. Yeah. I like the I like it because it's a one by one pyraminx and Rubik's cube solving, which means if you don't know how to solve a pyraminx, it's already solved. Good job. Wait, wait. I I that that flew over my head. If you don't know how to solve a pyraminx, it's already solved. How does that work? <laughs> Schrodinger's Rubik's Cube, where it's only <laughs> solved if you don't know how to solve it. So the normal pyraminx, I think, like, you know how there's a 3x3 three three Rubik's Cube? Yeah. Uh, there's different sizes of pyraminxes, because a pyraminx has more pieces than the, the, the shape we were just talking about, the thing. Um, and so a pyraminx has got a bunch of pieces, and a normal pyraminx, like the most common one, is called a 3x3. Three if you bring down the number of pieces, it turns into a 2x2. Two two. If you bring down the number of pieces, it turns into a 1x1, one one, but it only has one piece, and it's just that shape. It reminds me of, like, all the joke videos I've seen on YouTube on how to yeah. solve a 1x1x1 one by one by one Rubik's Cube. Exactly. They're very helpful, by the way. I learned a lot from them. The 1x1x1 <laughs> one by one by one Rubik's Cubes? That's the Rubik's Cube equivalent of, like, Zero Edo. <laughs> yeah, I know my tonality composes in Zero Edo. Dude, I hate Zero Edo so much. People love to bring it up because it's a funny joke or whatever, but it gets so annoying. Yeah, I don't like it because, I don't know, I think it goes back to the limitations of my own human mind. Because I view it as like one note, and then people have like six hour long discussions about what it is, and I'm like, it's one note, you know? I don't really, yeah, the thing is, I just don't care. Yeah. It's it's purely theoretical as far as I'm concerned. Well, to be honest, I've kind of used Z Zero Edo in terms of a basis for isomorphic layout, but obviously I didn't use the p wall of Zero Edo, <laughs> which makes things even more interesting. All tunings are actually polysystemic zero EDO. <sighs> See, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is what I'm complaining about. <laughs> I. It also bugs me when I talk about how, like, five is the lowest practical EDO, and someone comes in and says, no, you can write melodies with four EDO. Yeah, you can, but would you want to? You know what? I'm actually going to counter that by saying... I think because we use 12 and it's highly composite, we're used to rolling out certain lower ones. But if we use like 13 or something, then like 4 would still be alien to us. We'd be like, oh, that's interesting to compose in, you know? Yeah, but like, you could just use 8. Yeah, but for 5, you could just use 10. I, I agree with that, actually. <laughs> I mean, if it's, if it's practical on whatever instrument you're using. Yeah. Number 15. Zero Edo. The last thing you want for your tuning system to do is give you only one note, but as it turns out, that might be what you get. He had his shoes on, but that makes it even worse. I guess I could kind of see four Edo for an instrument, purely because eight notes is, you know, you could easily make an instrument for eight Edo, but it still might complicate fingerings on a woodwind, for example. I, I guess I could kind of see four, but like three with six Edo, I... Six Edo is already so small. I think what I chimed in about before was incomplete, because I think there's another thing that factors in, is the fact that it's so commonplace for humans to use five note and seven note scales, that it makes sense for us to be like, yeah, five Edo is like the lower end of it, you know? Because we're like, yeah, pentatonic, you know? Like, what's lower than pentatonic, you know? But there are some four note scales that have been found around the world but they're much more rare than five note scales hmm. i don't know i think i think what's melodic is very subjective and um i mean i don't think just a single note like zero edo at least zero edo with my perception of what it is 
I don't think that counts as melodic because obviously a melody moves up and down. But does it? I think so, right? Well, yeah, I guess. I guess for something to be a melody, there should be a change in a pitch during a time. Yeah, so... I think both melody and harmony are defined in terms of differences in pitch. I don't know, because, I mean, I hate to be that guy, but, like, technically there are pop songs where, like, the melody that we call the melody only stays on a single pitch the whole time, but there's changes in rhythm. Yeah, I let me let me actually sing a melody in Zero Edo, and you guys will know what it's from. Dum, dum, da 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 dum da 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 is that Star Wars? Yes. See? Look! Now, pr- granted, like, the original one was in 12 Edo and was longer, but that first part, you could say it's in 0 Edo, and I sung it, and you knew what it was from because of the rhythm. I don't care if I'm controversial, I consider that a melody, because, like, it's catchy, it sticks in your head, it fulfills all the other aspects of being a melody other than the pitch changes. Well, to be honest, for qualify to be like a zero either you don't even need to have pitch and then I can perform another <coughs> quote-unquote melody in zero Edo that would be recognizable <laughs> okay I'm gonna be honest like when you said pitch like I hear that as peach and now all of my head is filled with it, just like, in an alternate universe, Mario saves Princess Pitch. Just imagine, like, making a Zen parody of, like, an existing video game. Like, Princess Pitch and, like, the other stuff, like... Princess Pitch. Yeah, see, if you said Princess Pitch, it would sound like Princess Peach because of your accent. I'm sorry that my accent kinda complicates the listening of my... <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying, sir. <laughs> Look, guy, I'm a native English speaker, and there have been times where my own accent has gotten in the way of people understanding me. If I had a nickel for every time someone thought I said gree... So- someone thought I said grain instead of green, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but I it's am weird glad I don't twice. have an accent. I mean, if you don't speak, yeah, you. the only people who don't have an accent are the ones who just don't speak. So do they speak in Zero Edo? Ugh. <laughs> I mean, I am actually still thinking about this discussion, because yeah. the most common d- distinctions that I've seen between Edo's, Edo sizes on the very small end is that 5 is melodic, whereas 4 is chordal, and then... Three is chordal, whereas two is trivial or some other word. I think even if you can consider four and three to be vaguely practical melodically, I think two has got to be some sort of limit. Oh no! I think as long as there's changes in pitch, that's what matters. There's not much variance, you know. It's just the two different pitches, or two different notes, I should say. But it's still you could still write complex enough stuff in it. I actually would like to counter. Um, yeah. What you said about the only reason we don't consider 4 Edo is because it's not Zen to us. I use 6 Edo on its own. I do not use 4. Yeah, but it has enough notes, you know? Well, but that's the point that I'm trying to make, is that 6 is enough notes and 4 isn't. Yeah, but also, I think you might have mentioned before that 6 is kind of Zen to a lot of 12 Edo musicians because they don't ever use it, you know? I guess that's fair. I, I have claimed before that there are a few like pretty zen scales in 12 Edo. like diminished eight is probably common enough to kind of not be zen but i think augmented nine is augmented nine is probably the most classically zen scale in 12 is Edo. augmented is aug- wait no i'm not thinking of augmented nine am i i'm thinking of the one that goes like do 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 or something like that that would be That's augmented, augmented six. six. Oh, okay. Jinx, you owe me a Zen harmonic soda. <laughs> Actually, guys, I, I, I was kind of thinking that, like, uh, four idio is not suitable for melodies, but I've just... 
I've just opened <laughs> scale workshop tab with uh, for EDO and tried to come up with some with some melody and you know what I think who left the conversation who interrupted me who dared to <laughs> okay I'm sorry I think that for actually kind of can sound melodic let me <clears throat> try to show you I feel like that's some melody just happened. Yeah, I can see it. You can see sound? You have synesthesia? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I feel like one of the things that might influence what lower cutoff we have for EDOs being melodic is how much music we've listened to that has quote unquote melodies in them, you know? Because, like, if you could pull it off, you could pull it off. And that's why I still will die on the hill that. I think Zerito, you could still have melodies like in pop music, because like, I I don't know, it's, I don't know, I think at the end of the day it's subjective, right? We all have our own lower cutoffs, but... Then what's the difference between a Zerito melody and just a rhythm? Is it the fact that Zerito has defined pitch, and yeah. something that's purely a rhythm doesn't? Yeah, like you could sing it or whatever. And then you have to get into what counts as defined pitch. Some drums have a pretty definable pitch, and others don't. Yeah, but I think it's about execution. Like, do you play those drums? Are you playing them as a melody? You know, like, is that fulfilling that role in a song? It could. You know, um, in my nine Edo piece recently that I released called Escape, but with, like, weird letters, like... Spongebob case. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, like... I basically used the snare drum as, like, a melodic line at one point because of how I pitched it around. I think the melody mix is actually satisfying. I know Ground, like, didn't like that as much, but I am proud of how I made that melody that goes... No, that part I really did like. I just said overall the song is not my type of music, but the thing with the pitched snare drum is I did the same thing in my own uh, 9 or 25 video piece. Really? Yeah, I took a sample of the of the snare drum from Animusic Harmonic Voltage, because it's one of my favorite sounding snares. And I pitched it around. Put some reverb on it. I love that. Oh my goodness. Animusic was my childhood. The Animusic was basically like my whole life because it's always I existed know. since I've been born. I didn't get into Animusic until I was like six or something, but I liked it. For some reason, didn't get into it until I was six. It's like, <laughs> it's like yep. five year old you is like, I just don't get this anime music. I think it's, um, oh yeah. no, I mean, I never heard it until <laughs> I was like six or something, but, um, I don't know. At least one of them creeped me out, like the, the visuals. Apparently, uh, apparently, I was laughing at like Pipe Dream when I was two or something. <laughs> I think the first time I ever saw anime music was in music class when I was like eight years old or something. Blew my mind at the time, found it on uh, the internet later, and it was great. I'm still sad that anime music 3 never came out. Yeah, me too. Uh, <clears throat> nothing, nothing, no sign today, my man. Please, no plumbing in the chat. <laughs> Right now we're going to have to put the message on screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a really funny joke, though. Ah. As, as was established in the um, reverb fart episode, my humor is broken. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what? It, it might have been like the... You know that one futuristic one that took place in space? Yeah, Starship Groove. Yeah, it might have been that one, just because, like... It just kind of scared me. I was like, this is the future. Not like I was upset, but I was just like... I kind of get that, because the thing is, the ship has no interiors. 
<laughs> like it's just a bunch of metal plates stuck together with you know little channels for the musicians to go back into when they're done. That's not a way to live. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fun fact. Um, I actually made a YTP MV of Starship Groove using My Little Pony <laughs> clips, and I called it Mareship Groove. I saw that. It was pretty great. Did you Did you actually watch it? Because I, like... Yes, you sent it to me, and I watched it all the way through. See, now you gotta do one of those, um, except... <laughs> except one of the sounds is my, uh, Fluttershy wheeze from episode zero. The April Fool's episode where I died at the reverb fart. I mean, like, I guess, I guess I could do that. I could do as just a Zender Garden YTPMV. <laughs> like, okay, I do want to do that though. Once we have enough of a library of Zender Garden samples. Yeah, but the other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to try another My Little Pony YTPMV, but for a Zen song, and then it occurred to me. I, I could do it for Starfish by Sevish, and I could call it Star Dash because of that one <laughs> clip of Rainbow Dash kicking a cloud that sounds like this sick kick drum. I love sampling things. I love finding sounds that I like that other people might recognize, like that Animusic snare. I think there's also, um, so that Animusic snare is part of an instrument that I just titled Soundboard in Contact. Some of the other sounds in that soundboard are um i think buzz light year hitting into the uh the pin board i don't know what you call those things the things with like the pins in it where you stick your hand in and it makes an imprint on the other side oh buzz light you're slamming into things. one of those in toy story 2 that was one of the samples and i think i used it in the song and i also think i used the vine bonk sound effect i used the i used the metal pipe in my recent piece <laughs> i love the metal pipe me because if you've ever been around a metal pipe, you know exactly what that sounds like. I also need to get my family's old Mac out and sample the and sample the electronic toms from Magic Garage Band. Because Garage Band used to have this thing called Magic Garage Band where you could just input the instruments and it would make a song with some pre-recorded parts. And there was this drum kit that, as far as I'm aware, isn't available in the rest of Garage Band that had these electronic toms, like these very 80s sounding electronic toms. And I thought that was great. I've used, I found a similar sound online that I sampled in one of my, in one of my covers, but getting that exact sound because it holds significance to me would be great. Uh, in one of uh, club EPs uh, I was on, one guy did some sort of shaker sample and i've uh, i've used it it sounded really nice and then i i've asked him where did he get the sample from and he told me that he had just like a random box with nails on his table and he just shook it a little and recorded it <laughs> i mean that's fair there was like this one Jacob Collier song where like one of the shaker sounds was him like just shaking like a plastic tray of like forks and knives and stuff <laughs> like that was the sample he used and like you can see it on the camera because like you know um yeah I haven't been like making stuff like releasing stuff in Reaper for long because when I first got Reaper I like went into this like crazy analytic mode where I was just like trying to get the most amount of production information online as I possibly could while never actually putting time into production. So so far I've only actually released three songs using Reaper and yet I want to finish an album by the summer. But anyway, the silliest thing that I sampled so far is a kind of a funny conversation that my friends had and like one of them just like asked for whatever reason what color is seven and then another one of them said it's orange and i sampled that because i was writing the song in 70 though so i was like this is perfect i'm using this and that's why i called it orange Irion. maybe i should sample jan measley saying here's tree in one of my songs that would be kind of a wacky sample yeah that would I don't know if I ever told the tree story on this podcast, but in 2020, 
uh, the tree that was in my parents' house's yard was getting cut down. And it had a little baby tree growing on top of it for years. And before that tree, before the big tree got cut down, I finally pulled the little tree out. And that little tree is now just in a pot in my apartment. And when I posted the picture of my new apartment with the tree in it, someone replied with, here's tree, a reference to the On Me Sleep video. And I thought that was so great. And so now here's tree holds a special place in my part, in my heart. That's... That's actually a very wholesome story. Yeah. I love my tree so much. We both have our pets. You know, my boyfriend has his gecko. And I have my tree. <laughs> Do you take tree for walks? <laughs> well, the closest I ever came to taking my tree for a walk. So this tree is like... It's like f over five feet tall, I think. And so it's a little bit inconvenient to take for walks. Um... The closest I ever came to taking it for a walk was just very awkwardly putting it in my car to move it to the apartment. And the tree did not like it. After after I moved it, it lost a bunch of leaves, and I was very worried. Uh, but now the leaves all but now uh, it grew a bunch of new leaves, and I think it's doing better than it ever has. So I'm happy. That was a very dramatic moment for my tree. It was just it was just popping off like the old data and then like running commands to push new data onto it <laughs> array dot push parentheses leaves parentheses semicolon it, no it's because like a tree is also an actual data structure in computer science that was the joke yep. yeah i know i just i just thought it was a really funny imagery like array dot push new leaves yeah. and there are so many type of trees Ever since I learned about the binary search, I've found ways to use it in my everyday life. Like if I'm uh, if I'm working on code and I need to find the piece of code that does something in like a markup language, I'll do a binary search where I erase the top part, and if it gets rid of the thing that I'm looking for, I'm like, oh, it's in the top part, and then I'll erase the top half of that or the bottom half of that, and fi to find what it's in, and just go down until I eventually find the line of code I'm looking for. I've also done binary searches in real life when I'm editing images and I need to find the exact right threshold to set for uh, like the paint bucket tool. And so I'll, I'll set it to 100 and then 50 and then 25 and then 75, etc. Whatever I need to do to find the exact, exact right threshold. Yeah, same. Is image editing real life? You know what I mean. When I say real life, I, I mean anything that doesn't, involve a literal binary search in an array well i've used it in like real real life situations for example if i'm trying to come up with some recipe okay so like eight eggs is too much let's let's try four okay four eggs is not enough let's try six and so on. Mm, that makes sense i use bogo search in real life <laughs> <laughs> we need to normalize using like efficient algorithms in real life like for example when we're like sorting something in real life like the general like human algorithms doing that it just kind of like fumble around kind of move things around until it's sorted but like if we used quick sort in real life it would make things so much easier like if we had a bunch of unsorted stuff we could just be like oh let's just put all the stuff less than this thing on this side and all the things more than that thing on the other side and keep going for from there and it would make our life so much easier instead of like just going ah this goes here that goes there da, 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 da. i think it depends on the circumstance i'd have to try it out to see if it's actually practical yeah now that i think about it like sorting something in real life is like actually a lot easier because you can see when things are out of order you don't have to like blindly traverse through your array of items until you find the places where things are out of order so what i just said you can you can like take back what i just said because i think some of those algorithms might make things more efficient like imagine like just doing a bubble sort in real life like you can see when things are out of order but you're like no i'm just going to go whoop swap whoop swap the whole way through the things you're sorting whoop swap whoop swap couldn't have said it better myself that's my catchphrase <laughs> Let's alphabetize the furniture so we can find it all. 
Yeah, that's, that's what's everyone's catchphrase in here. <laughs> Mine is Jeep, because one time I tried to say Jeepers and Crepes at the same time, and I said Jeeps, and now I just actually say Jeeps sometimes. I am a real human. <laughs> that's a good catchphrase, yeah. <laughs> hey, Zeno, what are you doing? Oh, hi, I'm eating human food, because I'm a human. I'm watching human TV. Look at these humans doing human emotions and actions. I have human organs. <laughs> Boy, I sure do love having human organ. <laughs> <laughs> you just say that all the time, yeah. I think robot organs are better, but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> I would actually love to have a channel on this Discord server for like Amazon reviews for different tunings. That'd be cool. I'm down. Four Edo, one star. Not enough notes. Don't know what I expected since it's literally in the name, but still one star. Who's the Amazon seller going to be? <laughs> we need the Amazon seller to respond incredulously. Irv Wilson. <laughs> and it's true. Irv Wilson invented Four Edo. Okay, easily Blackwood. I think, and I think realistically, anyone can just make a message as the Amazon seller. Yeah. But like, if somebody invented a particular temperament, like Flutterpyth or Pentagoth, those are the two nice temperaments that I had a hand in inventing. Then I then I could respond as the seller. It's like like the review for Flutterpyth is like, why do the thirds sound weird? And I, and I reply like, cause Flutterpyth isn't a five limit temperament. It's a neo gothic temperament. That's the point. Just go use Superpyth or Ultrapyth if you want pental thirds. Jeez. Or like a 19 EDO review, it's like, I do like a particular temperament in this, but my parents don't want me doing witchcraft. <laughs> my 19 EDO review would be like, I really like the 13 over 12 semitone, but it kind of got old pretty quick. Actually, I can't remember off the top of my head whether the 13 over 12 semitone is more accurate in 19 or 26 EDO. I think Edo's like 19 and 26 definitely have a particular sound, much like 22 Edo has a particular sound, but it's not something that I really want to use generally. Like 33 Edo is where you get to the point where it's the fifth is so flat that it doesn't use the flat tone mappings for the thirds anymore. In the five limit, it uses uh, this temperament that I came up with, and I think. I, you know, I discovered this temperament independently or whatever, and then I brought it up and Scott Dakota recommended calling it tragicomical temperament. So I think I'm going to go with that, uh, where instead of C to E being the major third, like in Mean Tone, or C to D sharp, like in Super Pyth, it's C to E sharp. Oh. <laughs> like the thirds are so neutral that you actually have to use sharps to get a major third and flats to get a minor third. I f it isn't like 40 Edo like slightly better at tragicomical just because the major third is 390 cents instead of 400? Well, yes, and the minor third is 300 cents rather than 291. But I like what 33 Edo does because, as you can probably tell, I am a fan of neo gothic minor thirds. So I make such a big deal about pentagoth temperament. Not as big of a fan of neo gothic major thirds, but I do like neo gothic minor sixths. It's not like the futility of composing can be made better with Black Dye and Pentagoth, but they help. <laughs> For anyone who doesn't get that reference, that is a quote from Goth Fluttershy. <laughs> when, when you posted that image, like, it, generally, it genuinely made me cry a little because I was laughing so hard. Probably because it's just a combination of, of all of the things that I am. A person who loves Pentagoth and Black Dye and a person who has more than one notable similarity with Goth Fluttershy. Hey guys, I gotta go to eat dinner. I'll see you guys. See my audio got corrupted when Thank my you. PC turned off earlier. Well, the show must go on. We'll, we'll just have corrupted audio. <laughs> you, just, you put it in unchanged. The part where Cam says, um, my audio got corrupted. I just turned on the Among Us auto-tune. Why would you do that? I would do that to be funny, Ground. But I know I'm also not, like, as funny as I think I am, so... Wait, that creates a paradox, because if I think I'm not as funny as I think I am, then I'll be, like, I'll be asymptotically unfunny. Asymptotically unfunny. Alright, time to use- time to put that in my, uh, 
in my Twitter bio or something. Tinder bio, Tumblr bio, whatever, they all sound the same. I need to leave you for a couple minutes, as always. <laughs> for, for, for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons that the listeners won't know about. It'll be as elusive as the 21 over 20 problem because it's completely edited out of the podcast episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I was really, I, I was being kind of obnoxious going on for several minutes about the 21 over 20 problem. Would you tell me about this problem later? I, I could actually give a pretty concise explanation right here. Difference between 7 over 4 and 5, 5, 5 over 3? So basically, the 21 over 20 problem is a term that I coined for finding a good way to construct a quasi-diatonic 2, 3, 5, 7 low, co low complexity JI scale with 21 over 20 as the semitone. It seems easy if you start with, uh, with the intervals 8 over 7, 6 over 5, 4 over 3, but making an elegant system is much harder. My chosen solution to the 21 over 20 problem is this scale uh, called 5L2M5S, uh, because basically... It's it's one of my like main quasi diatonic scales. There's five uh, L two S in the three limit, yep. and then there's five L two M one S and five L two M three S in the five limit, and then there's five L two M two S and five L two M four S in the seven limit. Five L two M five S is kind of the the union of both sides mm, okay. because it generally this scale works the best if you temper out. Uh, 5,120 over 5,103, which is the difference between the syntonic comma and the septimal comma. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's my solution to the 21 over 20 problem. And in that, uh, there's, there's different modes that you can use. I use a quasi-Aeolian scale because Aeolian is the best scale, obviously. The problem with this scale is that it only really works in, uh, in Edo's 41 and above. You could technically use it in 34, but it doesn't represent the seven limit very accurately. I think in the example I gave, I referenced uh, 41, 46, 53, 99, and 152, the latter of which are very good for hemifamity temperament, mm -hmm. which is what the 2357 version of the scale relies on. Other ways of solving the 21 over 20 problem are just tempering out uh, the syntonic comma in 31 Edo septimal mean tone, or the septimal comma in 27 or 49 or 22 Edo Superpyth. My favorite version of Superpyth is uh, the 65 Eigenmanzo version, which is approximated almost exactly by 76 Edo. Of course, 76 is pretty big, so I only use it if I am using like a subset. I generally don't use subsets when composing. Yeah, I have a similar problem with uh, 81 Edo. It is kind of great for mean tone. It kind of can do a good porcupine by non-pival but uh and it, it's really great in both mean tone because it's basically on uh near golden mean tone and it is great for porcupine yeah. and uh, i'm feel like it is the first edo that does mean tone and porcupine really good but at the same time it is pretty large yeah, I mean, so Superpyth isn't Pattonvel in 76 Edo either. Once you get to Edo's that big, you're probably not going to be using the Pattonvel for anything yeah. other than like lattice scales. My new philosophy, I mean, it's been my philosophy for a while, but I think I've gotten better at sticking to it recently, is to not really use big Edo's and expect them to and find an Edo that I can expect to do everything, and instead use medium sized Edo's. Like for me, the Edos that I use are generally like 24 to 37 when it comes to like quasi diatonic stuff. For Xenofifth stuff, for stuff that's not diatonic at all, you know, I'll, I'll use um, 11, 16, and 25 Edo, but that's besides the point. I, I basically use medium sized Edos and then just switch between them whenever I decide that I want to use a different scale. Whatever scale fits, whatever tuning fits the particular musical idea that I have, I just use that. I talked about it on my, on my Tumblr a bit. You can always use a colossal EDO like 68,468,400 EDO for everything. <sighs> right. Yeah. But then just, you, but just find a massive multiple of 12 and then just use the 12 EDO scale of that and call it Z. Based. 
There is no EDOs that have a step size of 138 cents, right? I mean, it depends on like, yeah, there's an EDO that has exactly that if you get big enough. But like, if you're looking for an EDO that like one step of the EDO is 138 cents, the best you're going to do is nine because nine EDO has a step size of 133 and a third cents. Yeah. Nine EDO is not fun for me. Why not? It's just not enough notes, really. I think, so I talked about this in the Nine Edo Tuning of the Month channel. I think the reason that I don't like Nine Edo is because it doesn't have anything that even resembles a tone. Like, generally, I would consider the bounds to be 25 Edo, so like, the, the smaller neutral second of 104, 144 cents is kind of the bottom end for what can be melodically, like, a tone. And the upper end is from 5 Edo, the 240 cents and 9 Edo is thoroughly outside of that bound. It's the only Edo after 4 that doesn't have any intervals in that range. And not having a tone makes it hard to connect with. I really like how 9 Edo works melodic, sorry, harmonically, but not how it works harmonically. Oh, for cripe's sake. Melodically. I like how it works harmonically, but not melodically. We're just gonna be like, I like this tuning harmonically, but not harmonically, but I do like it mon melodically, <laughs> but not melodically. And by the way, the floor is made of floor, and the reason they call it oven is because you oven <laughs> like the- I forget the rest of that copy pasta. <laughs> you oven the cold food of how not eat the food. <laughs> there you go. To quote Wad Wizard, why do they call it cargo when cars stay without the luggage, cargo take the luggage away? <laughs> <laughs> we need to we need to invent like a Zen harmonic copy pasta. That's just like someone trying to explain some kind of Zen concept, but it sounds like they're having a stroke. Why do they call it E Do when E don't do the small intervals, E do do the big intervals? No, that sounds too logical to work. Yeah. Like that actually kind of makes sense a little <sighs> bit. Well, excuse me for making sense. A human emotion. Actually, ground, I've just thought about two temperaments that put 22 over 20 uh, in very convenient spots. You mean 21 over 20? Uh, 21 over 20, yeah, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, what did I just say? <laughs> so I, I'm not denying that there are temperaments that make 21 over 20 pretty easy, but the, the issue is making something is using a quasi-diatonic lattice scale that uses 21 over 20 as the semitone. That's the problem. Let me just like talk a little bit about like two possibilities that I see, uh, uh, not with diatonic, two, two temperaments that make uh, uh, 21 over 20 a very comfortable, to say, interval. First of them is Pajara, which <clears throat> while it's not very accurate of a temperament, it's still good enough, I'd say. And can you hear it? Yeah, I could hear it just fine. It kind of equates 21 over 20 with 16 over 15 and 15 over 14, which makes this some very comfortable shapes in like isomorphic layout and stuff. So like major try it and I go down the Pajara semitone down in the top voice and we get to major seventh then we get to harmonic seventh chord and finally major sixth and it's just so convenient because they are literally the same interval apart i don't think that would work um i don't want to like put words in ground's mouth but i know that like when ground was talking about this earlier she was saying how 21 over 20 is the perfect semitone because it's around 85 cents and in pajara that gets tempered to like 109 yeah, 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 cents yeah. or 105 depending on what tuning you use there are some caveats to what i said about the perfect semitone so purely melodically speaking I would say that around 75 cents is the perfect semitone, which is why I like 32, 33, 31, 16 Edo so much. But as a general use semitone that works in both the 235 and 237 lattices, 
21 over 20 is perfect because 21 over 20 is a full septimal interval and it's around 85 cents, which can work in both lattice. My chosen solutions as someone who doesn't really work in Edo's that are above 37 to the 21 over 20 problem are 31 Edo septimal mean tone and 27 Edo super pipe because 31 Edo septimal mean tone leads to a 237 diasem scale that tempers the 28 over 27 to be the same as 21 as the the Edo's mapping of 21 over 20. It's about 77 cents in 31 Edo. The same thing happens in 27, 27 Edo Super Pyth. I use the uh, 235 black die scale from that, and it tempers the, the mapping of 16 over 15, which is very narrow in 27 Edo, which is one of the reasons I love 27 Edo so much. It tempers that to be the same as its mapping for 21 over 20 at 89 cents in 27 Edo. The other temperament I want to mention that puts 21 over 20 in really convenient spots is the beep temperament because it tempers this interval out. No interval, no problem. <laughs> no interval, no problem. Yeah, I guess... Th- <laughs> I guess that's just the uh, tagline for tempering out commas. You know, I was looking at different uh, exo temperaments in the five limit, or just any any temperament in the five limit, just looking at all the different five limit commas that show up. It looks like, as far as I can tell, there is no name for the temperament that tempers out 10 over 9. It's actually pretty interesting. What it does is it makes the, it makes the, the perfect fifth very sharp, like 775 cents or something like that. And then that that makes it so that uh, two of them stacked on top of each other is a five over four. I use some crazy exo temperaments. I love to use them in strange ways because on their own, they don't work at all. Like I'm talking not about stuff like uh, bug and beep, which kind of still works. I'm talking more about, yeah, tempering out uh 10 over 9 or uh 9 over 8 or 8 over 7 9 over 7 that kind of stuff it still can work if you use it with the idea of uh zen timbers basically if you if you uh, use non-harmonic timbers if you construct the new "Quote unquote <laughs> overtone scale uh, in terms of this temperament, and use it as a basis for a timber of an instrument that you would play in such temperament, which kind of, in a sense, it redefines the the intervals themselves because, like, yeah, it redefines the primes. Yeah. Yo, I hate the word timbre so much. It's such yep. a dumb word. It's French, isn't it? Look at the French ruining everything again. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with you that extreme exo temperaments are useful for Zen timbres and also for very small Edos. Like there are some there are some tunings where like for example, a father temperament which tempers out 16 over 15 is a terrible temperament generally speaking, but it does work in eight Edo. Yeah, yeah. It's one of my pet peeves when when people reference the Oniratonic scale and call it a father scale, because it really isn't. Father is, there are such great Oniratonic temperaments, and father is not one of them. Father is the eight Edo temperament. Yeah, I, I, I've had a meme example of a small sketch uh in a temperament which tempers out six over five and eight over seven. <laughs> oh boy <laughs> let me post it in chat the link to the post and i'm pretty sure i've done similar things several times just for fun oh that's really interesting sounding yeah it really is this is silly, but I want to actually make like a good Zen copy pasta. 
like sometime before we end the podcast because I think it would be funny. I mean, the best the best Zen copy pasta is the fake pretentious music one. Yeah, that's true, I guess. But like, I'm kind of referring to one that's more stroke like. <laughs> I am very good at that type of humor. <laughs> Why do you call it, why do they call it J.I. when J.I. write the good music, J.them write the bad music, Runaway write the good music? That, that's really close. We're getting there. We're getting there. Why, why do they call it J.I. when J.U. temper out commas when I don't, when I... <laughs> the, the problem is, like, getting it to kind of, like, hold its structure, like, it, like, sound... It's supposed to, like, sound like it's trying to make sense, but it just doesn't. You know what I mean? <laughs> just select just select any of the moments from the podcast we've recorded in the past where I try to explain something and then just totally lose myself. No, actually, your explanation of 21 over 20 problem was solid as ground. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, sometimes sometimes my explanations make sense, and sometimes when I'm not paying attention to the words I'm saying, you get why do they call it of in. <laughs> why do they call it J-I when J-U of in the comma temper of out E-D-O temper the schisma?